when you go through and you see people suffering um, or you yourself are suffering, uh, I think the first thing we can do is, is have acknowledgement of God, mm -hmm. right? To, to not, like me, I immediately want to go in and fix it. And that's one of the things that I've been struggling with, seeing friends of mine having their houses destroyed. Yeah. And I'm like, I want to go there and fix it. Uh, while at the same time, my first response needs to be, no, wait a minute, God, you're in control. Yeah. Like, let me rest in the fact that you are going to work. You're working on behalf of those that I love. Well, hey, Woodside family, Pastor Chris here, joined by a couple of our pastors, uh, brothers and friends. I want to have a conversation today that I think is appropriate for this time of year. Many call this time of year the most wonderful time of the year, and truly it is. We get a chance to uh, share the greatest story ever told, the story of the coming of the Son of God into the world. But why did Jesus have to come? Why do we need a Savior, a Redeemer, a Rescuer? Well, Genesis 3 reveals to us uh, that sin has entered into the world, and because of sin, brokenness and separation from God. And because of that, I think it's highly appropriate that we have a conversation about what it means to live in a fallen world. Now, recent events, such as the tragic shootings at high, sc uh, at high schools across the country, more specific to our region, Oxford High School being the latest of those, and then uh, the tornadoes that have uh, ripped through uh, the Midwest and Central Plains of our nation as well, have caused us, uh, many across the country, to ask the question again, why does God allow evil? Now this is a question that Christians have been asking for two millennia now and been giving, I think, solid, biblical, incredible answers. But we felt it was important for our church family that we have this discussion. So today, I want us to discuss why evil. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, Pastor Jeremy Reibold. Uh, Jeremy is one of our lead pastors. He's the campus pastor of our Plymouth campus and super grateful for you joining me. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, glad to be here today, Pastor Chris. Thank you. And uh, joining me, uh, sandwiched in between, is Pastor Jeff Keith. The pastor, uh, Jeff, does a great job leading it out at our Warren campus and also is connected to Mayfield, Kentucky. You lived there for a while. Yeah, we lived there um, back in the mid-2000s, and I served at First Baptist Mayfield as the youth pastor. And a couple of your kids were born there, yeah, too. Yeah, my, my two youngest were both born in Mayfield, and uh, so it's a, it's a community that has a, a very special uh, place in our heart, and so when we see things like this, it just it kind of is that, that gut punch of, yeah. like, God, what are you doing, and why is this happening? You know, we were talking before we began to record about the fact that we all personally have our own stories of brokenness and pain and suffering. And so this isn't something we just talk about theoretically. Uh, but I do want to start with the question, Pastor Jeremy, uh, of why uh, does God allow evil? I think that is a big question on people's minds. And there's so many different ways to answer. But why don't you take a first uh, swing yeah, at it? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, we could say, and we, we have alluded to the fact that this is something that theologians and philosophers and biblical scholars and everybody's debated probably yeah. since the beginning of human history. I mean, it's just yeah. uh, this, this massive question uh, in, in front of us. Um, and I think there's a right place for us when we look at the scriptures to see, yes, the, the reality that evil does exist, mm -hmm. um, but we also see a God who is uh, powerful over all things, yes. who is loving. Uh, that's his definition of his very nature. God yes. is love. Um, and a God who knows all things. And and yet we as human creatures don't possess those attributes in totality ourselves. And yeah. so uh, in, in one sense, we are butting up against a limitation of our creatureliness yeah. that we can't escape. And yes. that is that is to say, I don't know. I don't know all these I, things. I don't know. I can't look past the veil fully. The scriptures say the secret things belong to the Lord, but those things that he has revealed to us mm -hmm. and to our children. And uh, so we can look at the scriptures and say, okay, we can see what God reveals in so many ways about who he is and what he's doing in the world. Um, and even glimpses beyond that curtain of his providence and his divine will. But in some cases, he doesn't give us that glimpse. Yes. And so that's where I think we're wise to maybe just cup our mouths and say, I don't know on this yeah, case. Yeah. It's, it's true that it's there, um, but for me to yes. push past, past that, I'm, yes. I'm not sure I'm going to always get the right answer or yeah. the best answer. Um, yeah, right. I think that w was so great that you start there because I think that's the place that human beings have to start, that his ways are higher than our ways. Mm -hmm. I also think that one of the mistakes, uh, Jeff, that we often make, and 
dealing with this question is to think that there has to be one answer, yeah. one, one silver bullet, when the fact of the matter is it could be for multiple reasons that God has allowed a particular evil act to happen. Certainly what comes to mind are things like uh, God's judgment uh, for certain situations after he has again and again given someone an opportunity to repent and warn them, hey, turn around, don't go this way, and they continue to press on, then judgment uh, does happen. I can also think of the fact that some suffering actually matures me and, and causes me to be conformed to the image of Christ. Uh, then I can also think of the fact that all suffering and evil and brokenness causes me to long for something beyond this world. Um, there's, there's not a time where I experience brokenness. I think about when my son passed away, the part of the, the hope that kept me and my wife was the longing for heaven. The fact that we believe, we know that we are going to uh, rejoice with him again. Uh, and and that, that gives me hope. And so those are just some things. But, but Jeff, what is your thoughts go when you think about why, oh Lord? Yeah, there are um, um, a lot of brokenness and a lot of pain in this world. And some, some as we've kind of alluded, we bring on to ourselves because of our poor decisions. Yes. Right? And so some of it is a, it's a direct consequence of, of poor decisions. But sometimes uh, there's evil in the world, and we are the recipients of, of years and years and collateral damage from other people's decisions. Yeah, yeah. And yet in the midst of all of that, we are constantly reminded that God is still in control and that God is still good and God is using all of this for his glory and for our good and how that works out that's that's the mystery yes. you know but we we find ourselves so many times looking at life just like this where all we see is what's in front of us and what's happening to us and about us and sometimes as we come to scripture we see a lot of times God says no try to like pull yourself back away from the immediacy mm -hmm. and try to see like I'm sovereign I'm in control. I'm moving all things to, to my glorification and my end. Mm -hmm. And in the midst of that, suffering is here for a season. Yes. But suffering's going to end. There's coming yes. a time where justice is coming and uh, grace is, is coming as well as here and is coming. But yet at the same time, we live in this dissonance that constantly reminds us that we are desperately in need of the Savior, that we're not self-sufficient, yeah. that we're not self-reliant, mm -hmm. but that there is a God that loves us yes. and promises to walk with us through the suffering. Yeah, this already and not yet, yeah, you know, yeah. season of life. You know, I think about the different categories of suffering as well, guys. Um, I don't know which is harder for you. It seems like there's two broad categories of suffering. One we see in the incident at Oxford High School, what we would call moral evil, right? This type of suffering that comes because someone made a moral choice, in this case, to bring a weapon in and to assault fellow classmates and teachers and administrators. On the other hand, there's the natural evil that comes from tornadoes. Um, man, both are, are, are difficult to process. How do you process those things? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think on, on the hand of uh, the moral evil um, that we see in the world, you know, things like, like shootings and murder and, and just other violent acts, evil yes. against other human beings. We know that that is a direct product of the fall. Yeah. Um, once Adam and Eve uh, took the fruit that had been forbidden them and sin, their eyes were opened, and just from there on out, the human race, I mean, the very next chapter you go and you see yes. uh, Cain killing his brother, Abel, and yes. the first murder in Scripture. And, and so we, we have, I think, a good category in Scripture of these things happen because human beings are constantly violating the will and the ways of God. And, and the, I think the trouble for us is trying to figure out, okay, well, why isn't God just stopping that? Why doesn't he just put his foot down uh, altogether and just say, no more of that? Is yeah. he Im impotent? Is he, does he not have the power to do that? Um, and I think Scripture gives us a, good, uh, a few good places. I mean, Peter talks about it in, in 2 Peter where he is expressing these things are happening um, for, for two reasons. One, for God's judgment and His wrath to build up. He's storing yes. up wrath uh, to bring out and display His full justice in the universe. I mean, we, we talk about God being just, but we wow. have no concept of His full capacity of justice apart from the cross, but coming cosmically yes. on over, uh, over all things until the last day. But in His displaying justice, his, also His waiting is displaying His patience right now. 
here's the timing where today is the day of salvation. Today is the time for us to repent. And so while, while he's holding his hand back in leveling out justice rightly, he's also saying, repent, believe the good news, he turn and let, let his justice be applied fully on what he has done in Christ and not on us. Mm. Otherwise, we're waiting for that day where his full justice will be meted out uh, to those who will not repent. Yeah. And so it's a day of justice, or it's a day of patience, waiting for his justice to come. But that day of justice is going to come. And yeah. when we look to the end of the Bible, we see Revelation 19, Christ coming uh, on a horse, ready to make war against the nations, to bring justice, to make all things right, to wipe away every tear, yeah. and be with his people. Like that's, that's good news and hope for us. Jeremy, you talk about people not being uh, fully aware of uh, God's justice, yeah. right? I think people are not fully sensitive to his patience. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about why, oh Lord, and certainly you could stop this and wipe this out. Man, think about how long it took for me, for you, for any of us to come to the place of humility of heart, calling upon him for salvation. And I thank God that he was long suffering and merciful to me. Now, when you're on the other end of that, when you're the recipient of that type of thing, that's really hard. Um, but I think it's okay for us to encourage people that it's fine to acknowledge the lament. Mm -hmm. The Bible gives us much space. We preached earlier uh, this year about lament. The Bible gives us space to lament and to not deny suffering and evil. And I also think about, uh, we, we just taught through Romans 8. You see my Bible marked up, but Romans 8 and 19 for all of creation waits with eager yearning for the revealing of the sons of God. And so even creation reflects um, this sense of desire for redemption. And, um, and, and yet here we are having to live through it. I do want us, Jeff, to be able to talk practically. Um, my tendency is to get you know, theological, philosophical pretty quickly. But as I think about what Paul writes in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn or weep with those who weep. Talk about practically, how do we respond or how should we respond when uh, friends like those of yours in Mayfield or other places are, are going through? What should be our maybe more practical response? Yeah, I think, you know, um the psalmist in Psalm 46 um, gives us this. He starts off and he says, the, the Lord is uh, um, my refuge and strength, the ever-present help. And then he mm -hmm. says, though. And in that though, he then gives this image of uh, the mountains crumbling and falling into the sea and the sea raging. Mm. And we see the horror of nature. Yes. And uh, the horror of nature is, is overwhelming. Mm. Um, but yet he goes on later on in that. He says, you know, know, know that the Lord is, is our present help. He is our refuge. He is our strength. But then he kind of comes down in verse 10, and it's that famous verse, be still mm. and know, know that I'm God. Wow. Like it's almost as though you, when you go through and you see people suffering um, or you yourself are suffering, uh, I think the first thing we can do is, is have acknowledgement of God, mm -hmm. right? To, to not, like me, I immediately want to go in and fix it. And that's yes. one of the things that I've been struggling with, seeing friends of mine having their houses destroyed. Yeah. And I'm like, I want to go there and fix it. Uh, while at the same time, my first response needs to be, no, wait a minute, God, you're in control. Yeah. Like, let me rest in the fact that you are going to work. You're working mm -hmm. on behalf of those that I love. Yes. And you're an ever-present help. You are their fortress, not me. Because yeah. it's so quickly and so easily as Christians, mm -hmm. we can want to you know, ride in on our big, big horses and say, hey, we're here to save the day and not give God the credit at all. Um, but as we, we sit and we watch and we suffer, I think it's um, important that we point people back to God. That's good. Um, and realize that he's still in control, he's still on his throne, he is still working in the midst of all of these things. Yeah, it's so hard not to be a uh, rescuer, right? It's yeah. so hard not to uh, want to just simply fix things as you will, if you will. And I think for some, even the sense of guilt, like, man, I should have been able to, to stop this, but um, man, I love that you guys start with the sovereignty of God and then looking to the Lord. It's, it's interesting because you talk about how do we help people that are in that suffering. I think the best, the best part of the book of Job, at least from a human standpoint, <laughs> is when Job's friends show up 
and they don't say anything. They just sit with him in his agony for a week. They're just there. Yeah, yeah. The problem is, is when they start talking and like theologizing yes. and like, uh, attributing to Job, well, here's why this happened to you, and here's and they bring out their theodicies and their problems of what God and the universe and all that. That's when it all goes off the rails. Yes. But those moments where they're there able to sit and to be with the sufferer, that's that's what I think people in their suffering need. Yeah. As our presence is with them, showing them God and showing them just, um, again, our mouths are yeah. cupped, and yeah. I feel your pain. Yeah. I, I grieve with you. Yeah. It hurts. Yeah. yeah. I, and knowing and walking with people through suffering, I think the worst thing that we can do in a real practical way is to come alongside them and say, you know what I think. Yeah, that's right. They, that's they, right. In those moments of pain, they don't need to know what we think. Yeah. What they need to, what they need to be reminded of is what God himself has said. Yes. Because God is the one that heals. God is the one that's going to rise them from the ashes. And God is the one that ultimately wants to get the glory in all of those things. Yeah. I think that what we can do, I think back on the people who were by our side, uh, through the grief and loss of our son. And part of what they allowed us to do is they handled a lot of the practical things yeah. Yeah. to give us space mm -hmm. so that we can commune with the Lord, so that we can pray and know that, yeah, our kids are being fed and somebody's helping to take care of the house and some of those practical things. I think in the immediate aftermath of a, a tragedy, a loss, some great sense of suffering being present, not feeling the burden to have to answer every question, uh, but also looking for practical ways. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I know our temptation, my temptation is to say, well, Jeff, what do you need? Or Jeremy, what do you need? And sometimes a person may not even know uh, what they need. And so this is where we need to be sensitive and, and try our best to, uh, to, to help. I do wanna ask this question though, w what do we learn about um, uh, pain, suffering, and evil from the cross? When we look at the cross, what, what do you take away, Jeff, from the cross about this topic? Yeah, that, that to me is like the crescendo or the, the point of all of that. Yeah. Everything points to the cross where all pain, all suffering, mm. all evil, all of that was paid for. Yes. And Jesus endured the wrath of God that was due us uh, for that so that in his suffering and in his death and in his resurrection, we may be free. Yes. from that. We may be free from the justice of God that it was actually actualized on Christ himself. Um, so that is, that's what makes being a Christian so amazing, and that's what makes Christmas so amazing, yes. is, is the fact that we are here because of the cross. Yes. And in the midst of all of our suffering, in the midst of all of our pain, and in the midst of all this evil, we have one that has overcome. Yeah. And uh, that gives us hope, knowing that he's fighting those battles mm -hmm. uh, on our behalf. Jeremy, maybe some people who are watching may not know your family story, story with your mom. Maybe you could share it in brief, but I would love for you to maybe talk a little bit too about those who are struggling with unforgiveness. How do you forgive when maybe you feel like you've been wronged? Yeah, in 2014, and this is such a great question because in 2014, um, my mom was diagnosed with Ebola, which uh, was just ravaging West Africa at the time. and. Uh, we weren't sure she was going to be healed and get out. And the Lord just did some miraculous things there to get her to the uh, United States, get her in a hospital treatment uh, place where she could get healing. And she's fully recovered now. She's Praise back God. in West Africa serving. But in that year, we were also dealing with um, our family, just particularly a really um, toxic culture of a church that we were a part of, and wow. abuse there, and, and just some devastating things. And replaying, like, what... How do we, just in our personal suffering, mm. deal with those sorts of things? And the reality that I came to uh, and just been reflecting on is that um, I don't deserve anything of, of God's mercy or kindness myself. Wow. My sin, um, it's just as toxic. It's just as destructive. Um, and, and the way I've rebelled against God is painful to His name. Yes. And yet, He's given me His Son, Jesus. Yes. He's forgiven me all of my sin because of the work of Christ. And so if I can look to what God has done for me in Christ, I, I hope I can turn to those who have wronged me in so many ways and express to them the grace of God and what Christ has done for me to them. Mm. And that's what Jesus teaches us when he teaches us to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have, uh, are indebted to us. Yeah. Um, and so seeing the cross in our suffering reminds us that God suffers as well, that he has in Christ. So he sympathizes, he stands in solidarity with us in our suffering, but he also gives us the means and the power to be able to express forgiveness and mercy and compassion because that's the recipients that we yeah. are. 
yeah. of that as well. You know, people talk about the difficulty of believing Christmas because of the miracles. Man, how can you believe a virgin birth? And, you know, all of these uh, amazing things. I think for me, maybe the hardest part of the Christmas story that stretches me the most is God's ability and willingness to forgive us. Um, I think about how hard it is for me to forgive when I've been offended or hurt or someone has perpetrated some sense of evil against someone I love. But you had God knowing the full extent of the evil and, and fallenness of our hearts, um, the way that we abuse one another, mistreat, marginalize one another, his willingness to step in uh, to the world and to forgive us, um, that to me is the most overwhelming part of the Christmas story that uh, I don't know if my mind will ever be able to fully wrap uh, around and, and, and fully grasp. When I think about the cross, I also think about the fact that uh, God has entered into uh, our suffering, that um, Isaiah could have referred to uh, Jesus in any number of ways, but he wants us to know that he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He wants us to know that God cares for us. Gentlemen, I think that uh, is, is truly amazing. Um, for those, as we kind of get ready to wrap up, Jeff, for those who uh, may be grieving during this season and coming and seeing all our celebrations, uh, what do you want them to know about uh, the role of the church maybe in helping to care for them? Yeah, the, the, I'm so thankful that uh, I often say this uh, at the Warren campus too, that you know God, God has left, but he has not left us alone, but he's given us the church. This is the season of the church while we wait for him to come back and finally put all this yes. to peace. Uh, he's given us the church so that we don't have to walk alone, so we don't have to suffer in silence. Um, and if there's someone out there that's suffering now, don't do it alone. Yes. Uh, go to a church. If you don't have a church family, come to Woodside Campus and we will we'll care for you well. Um, but it's sharing that because it brings that into light so that others can join and help giving the, the, the peace and the prayers and the, just the encouragement that's needed through the times yes. of suffering. Yeah, I love that. I love that. This is the age of the church. Mm -hmm. This is our opportunity. Uh, Jeremy, any final thoughts? Yeah, just as, as we think about that, not only coming uh, to the church and being part of that community, um, but for us as the church to recognize, while we're, many of us are experiencing happy times and, and times with family and um, celebrations and gifts, it's, it's also a time for us to think about and to remember the poor and those who are not uh, in those moments of yes. seasons. Yes. And I think this is the time where the church should say, okay, what, what are we doing? We as individuals, what are we doing to care for and remember the poor, remember mm -hmm. the broken, remember the needy? Um, I, the story of Christmas just pounds that away to us. Yeah. God comes to young women who, a young woman who lives in the middle of nowhere and is nobody, mm -hmm. uh, a, a young man who's just a common, ordinary worker, yes. shepherds in the field, nobodies. And he shows up and he shows his glory. And the songs that they sing, Mary's song is a song about how God turns everything right and makes mm. everything new in the midst of, of agony and pain. And we as a church need to reflect on that and go, okay, what do we need to do to see um, wholeness brought, to be, to be people of shalom in our community? Who are the, you know, I think about who are the um, elderly in our church that are maybe shut in this season? Has anybody reached out to them and connected with them? Yeah. Who are those who maybe lost loved ones in this last year? That, like this season is going to be painful for them. Mm. Let's pick up the phone and call and just say, hey, we love you. Yeah. How are you? anything we can do for you there uh, to remember those who, um, who don't have and to care for them as well. So I think this is a season for the church to go beyond ourselves and caring for those who are hurting and, uh, and really display that well. Well, you know, the thing that I love about the scriptures is, is that it encourages us to take our big questions to the Lord. And so maybe you, you are struggling with either resentment, frustration um, with people, or maybe even angry with God. Uh, I would just say that as you process through those things, do it with an open Bible. And part of what I would encourage in coming to church is to process through your thinking on these things with the scriptures open. The Bible actually is so relevant and practical to our current moment. And so we can process through our laments and our frustrations and uh, ultimately, I think, land in the place of trust 
trusting in God's character, even when we may not fully understand his actions or activities. So maybe now's the time to cup our mouths. Maybe now's the time for us to say, Lord, we recognize that we only know uh, so much, but we hope uh, that this discussion helps you to do a few things. Number one, uh, to know it's okay to mourn. It's okay to, uh, to cry out to the Lord if you're hurting and know that uh, the church mourns with you as we long for the redemption of the Lord to be fully actualized. Uh, secondly, it's good for us to be mobilized. Thank God that I don't have to address all the needs of this world alone, uh, but that's where the local body comes into play, and I'm grateful for the response that our church consistently shows whenever we are, are connected to hurting uh, in our country or beyond. Um, I think thirdly, don't forget the message of the cross of Christ. Ultimately, uh, these are opportunities to point ourselves and others to Jesus uh, because he is the hope, the hope of a world that, yes, is experiencing brokenness but has the promise of salvation as well. Uh, Pastor Jeff, can you pray for us? Yeah, yeah. Father, we uh, come and are reminded of your, your sovereignty and your love and your grace, your mercy and your justice. And Father, though we don't understand these all completely, we know that you are God. And so Father, I pray for those right now that uh, are watching this and are going through a season of personal suffering. Father, I pray that they would rehearse that that they would rehearse your goodness and they would be reminded over and over and over again of, of your love and your grace and mercy. And Father, I pray that you'd also, through this season, give us eyes to see those that are suffering. Help us to see them. And would you help mobilize us so that we may move towards suffering? Um, for Father, it's something that we want to avoid, but in uh, our Christian call in the Great Commission, you call us to go. And so Father, help us to know what that means. Help us to know what that looks like. And Father, as we even enter into this season of, of giving glory to you for coming to be with us to save us from our sins, help us not to, to miss this opportunity to be reminded um, that we are desperately in need of you and you have provided everything that we need. So God, we pray that you be glorified and we pray that you come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as always, we have resources for you. Make sure you check out the postscript to uh, this particular episode of The Link, and uh, the resources are there to help you to continue the conversation and to keep growing in Christ. Please know that we love you and pray for you. And as Pastor Jeff said earlier, if you don't have a church family, we would love for you to come and visit one of our 15 uh, campuses here at Woodside. We have ministries for adults, uh, for our high school and middle school students, as well as for your kids, so that you can experience the joy of Jesus. Well, I can't wait until we're together again next time. Until then, God bless, and I hope you enjoyed this edition of The Link.